Nyala Karis Nunga Mot, Kayen Karek Nijabuja. We acknowledge the Nunga people as the original custodians of this land. We have gathered together this evening in the presence of Almighty God and of the whole company of heaven to offer to him through our Lord Jesus Christ our worship, praise and thanksgiving. We give thanks for the life of Bishop Brian Kine, acknowledging his many years of faithful service to the church, his devotion to his family and friends and his deep faith in God. We reflect upon the Holy Scriptures and experience the word being illuminated by music as we hear choral settings of sacred texts and also lift our voices in praise and worship. We pray for others as well as for ourselves that we might all know more truly the greatness of God's love and show forth in our lives the fruits of his grace. Wherefore, let us keep silent and remember God's presence with us now. O oh Lord, open thou our lips. And speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning,
Here beginneth the eighth verse of the third chapter of the book of Esther. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and separated among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people, and they do not keep the king's laws, so that it's not appropriate for the king to tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let a decree be issued for their destruction, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business, so that they may put it in the king's treasuries. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, son of Hammedatha the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. The king said to Haman, the money is given to you and the people as well to do with them as it seems good to you. The couriers went quickly by order of the king and the decree was issued in the citadel of Susa the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. Then Esther called for Hatak, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what was happening and why. When they told Mordecai what Esther had said, Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silence at such a time as this, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another quarter, but you and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you've come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. Here endeth the first lesson.
Here beginneth the 14th verse of the ninth chapter of the Gospel according to St. Mark. When they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. When the whole crowd saw him, they were immediately overcome with awe and they ran forward to greet them. He asked them, what are you arguing about with them? Someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought you my son. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. And whenever it seizes him, it dashes him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. And I asked your disciples to cast it out but they could not do so. He answered them, You faithless generation, how much longer must I be among you? How much longer must I put up with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. When the Spirit saw him, Immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. It has often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you are able to do anything, have pity on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you are able, all things can be done for the one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You spirit that keeps this boy from speaking and hearing, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. After crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out. And the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he was able to stand. When he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? He said to them, this kind can only come out through prayer. Here endeth the second lesson.
Thy mercy upon us and grant us thy salvation. O Lord, save the Queen and mercifully hear us when we pray Thy ministers with righteousness and make thy chosen people joyful. O Lord, save thy people. We beseech thee, let thy continual pity cleanse and defend thy church, and because it cannot continue in safety without thy succor, preserve it evermore by thy help and goodness, through Jesus Christ our Lord. O oh God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works do proceed, give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot keep, that both our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee, we being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness, through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of thy only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ,
let us give thanks for the life of Bishop Brian and for his service to God through his ministry of teaching and his friendship in Christ. Glorious God, with your whole church, we offer you our thanks and praise for all you have done for humanity through Jesus Christ. By giving him to live and die for us, you have disclosed your gracious plan for the whole world and shown that your love has no limit. By raising Jesus from the dead, you have promised that those who trust in him will share his resurrection life. For the assurance and hope of our faith and for the saints you have received into eternal joy, we thank you, Heavenly Father. And especially now, we lift up our hearts in thanksgiving for the life of Bishop Brian, now gone from us. For all your goodness to him through many days. For all that he was to those who loved him and for everything in his life that reflected your goodness and love. Blessed be your name, O Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who mourn, and especially for the family and friends of Bishop Brian. God of all consolation, in your unending love and mercy for us, you turn the darkness of death into the dawn of new life. Be our refuge and strength in sorrow. As your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by dying for us, conquered death, and by rising again, restored us to life, so may we go forward in faith to meet him, and after our life on earth, be united with our dear brothers and sisters in Christ, where every tear shall be wiped away, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray for the Anglican Board of Mission, Australia, for those who preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. God of all, bless the Anglican Board of Mission as it serves the church in Australia and our partner churches overseas. Inspire its work and its vision that all may come to know your justice your peace and your love, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for the work of education in our land. God of all truth, teach us to love you with heart and mind. Bless our schools, colleges and universities, that they may be lively centres for sound learning, new discovery, and the pursuit of wisdom. May all who teach and all who learn seek and love the truth and in humility look to you, the source of all wisdom and understanding through Jesus Christ, our Lord.
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> in the early 1960s, when I was a student at Trinity College in the University of Melbourne, and in deacon's orders, every second Sunday morning, after the College Eucharist, I would jump into a taxi, still robed in alb and cross stole, and go directly to the parish church of St. James in East St. Kilda. The taxi would be waiting outside the college chapel with its engine running so as to get me there in time to perform the deacon's liturgy at the solemn parish Eucharist. As a consequence of this connection with the people of the parish of East St. Kilda, I was invited to the 21st birthday party of a young woman, the daughter of parishioners, and herself a regular worshipper. This was an entirely unremarkable party, except for the fact that this young woman had been involved in a motor accident almost a year previously. She had sustained no apparent physical injury and seemed to have survived the trauma without ill effect, except for the fact that as a result of a horrendous bump on the head, she had entirely lost her memory. She could still speak and read and write, but she had no memory at all of the historical incidents and events of her former life. In the year prior to the party, she had to face the challenge of learning who her parents and siblings were, who her best friends were, where she had gone to school, and what sport she was sp supposed to excel at, and even to discover what her favorite food was and what had been her, her specific taste in music. All this was entirely gone. And when in a speech before the blowing out of the candles, she thanked everyone for coming and for being so supportive, she reflected that even though she was celebrating her 21st birthday, she in fact felt that she was really only one year old. Since the days of Freud and Jung, the importance of our memories in establishing our personal identities has of course become a commonplace of the modern science of psychology. We are who we are and have our identities as the unique persons we are, largely because of the particular thread of memories that make up our historical lives. Memories linger in our subconscious to shape us and condition us and often explain oddities and quirks of our present behavior. Traumatic memories survive over time, even when we think we have long forgotten them. And sometimes they have to be recovered and owned with professional help. And so we speak of the importance of the healing of our memories. But just a little reflection, and all of us can readily appreciate just how important even good and benign memories are in making us the persons we are. Our present interests, the topics of our conversation, and the quality of our continuing relationships with those near and dear to us depend on them. And that is why Alzheimer's can be so frighteningly destructive of the human capacity to relate. How often do we hear grieving people say, we feel that she actually left us a long time ago. Clearly the memory of who we are, are and who we have been and who others have been for us and we for them is very basic to the nature of our human experience. And what is true of us as individuals is also true of whole communities. A human community has its identity in large part by virtue of its memory of the thread of significant shared events of its history. 
Last Anzac Day, we celebrated, as we do each year, the memory of those who gave their lives in order to defend the freedoms that we now enjoy with its poignant ode, Lest We Forget. Even though we were in lockdown last April, with the help of electronic communication, the news coverage of marches elsewhere in the country, and TV pro programming saturated with war movies, we were all able to grasp again something of what it means to be Australian. The memory of Anzac has something profoundly to do with our Australian identity. And certainly to be Australian is not just a matter of holding an Australian passport that identifies us by nationality, though in legal terms that may be so. Nor to be Australian is it just a matter of living within the boundaries of this island continent girt by sea. For obviously, one can be an Australian even while living overseas. And indeed, perhaps there is a sense in which we feel more identifiably Australian when we are a little out of place in an alien culture, in Britain or America or elsewhere, than when we are at home. And that's because really to be Australian and to own one's Australian identity is to share in the Australian memory as a memory of our very own. Only Australians and New Zealanders remember Gallipoli in the way we do as an identifying token of our national psyche. For the same reason, Australia Day on the 26th of January is struggling to sustain itself as the day of celebration of our national unity that it once was, or at least thought to be. The sad fact is that it is no longer possible for Australia Day to be celebrated by all Australians in the same way because different sections of the community remember the 26th of January 1788 differently. As it, is thus increasing, as it thus increasingly gathers a capacity to be humanly divisive, the celebration of Australia Day and the memories it evokes ceases to be a community building force for good. Abraham Lincoln, in his second inaugural address as President, President of the United States in the wake of the American Civil War, was not being sentimental or fanciful when he said that the mystic cords of memory stretching from every patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of union when again touched as surely they will be by the better angels of our nature. He was not just being fanciful or sentimental but was appealing to the most profound potential force for reuniting the nation. As Christians, the importance of the church's shared corporate memory is something that comes naturally to us, of course, because we are members of the community that self-consciously grasps its distinctive identity through its shared memory of the life and teaching of Jesus. Obviously, at least in the first instance, when we regularly break and share bread in remembrance of him. No other community remembers the human Jesus in precisely the way the church remembers him. In faith, we remember him whom we now know as a life-giving spirit, and we know him whom we remember, and we know him as for us life-giving. Now this hour, this evening, is sacred to the memory of Brian Kime. We remember Brian and the uniquely human self that he was, and we give thanks for his life and work. And at the same time, we grasp something of his importance in making us who we are. For each of us remembers Brian the person a little differently whether as husband, as father, father-in-law, grandfather, as friend, as pastor, priest and bishop, as loyal colleague in work, 
or as good fun in company, as administrator, as fellow student, in retirement as parishioner at Subiaco or assisting here in the continuing ministry of the cathedral. We all come with our cherished individual memories of Brian. We give thanks for his contribution in so many diverse ways to the enrichment of our lives. And at the conclusion of this sermon, there will be a little reflective music to allow us to gather into focus some of our individualized memories of him. But in addition to our individualized memory of Brian, we have the opportunity this evening also to grasp something again of the importance of his shared memory in making us the community that we currently are. Brian's stellar ministry from parish priest in the Diocese of Melbourne to Dean of Geraldton, Rector of Christ Church Claremont, Assistant Bishop of Perth, and then Director of the Australian Board of Missions, speaks of an historical thread of life experiences that took him backwards and forwards across the continent, and that impacted, importantly, on the life of the whole Australian church, not just here in Perth, but nationally. There are two words that come to my mind as I remember Brian in this communal context. The words are mission and education. First, mission. At the time of Brian's appointment as an assistant bishop, the diocese underwent a goal-setting exercise through a series of partners in mission consultations, starting with parishes, which meant, met intentionally to set out their strategies for mission, with some partners from other parishes being present to keep them honest. And then came the same thing in rural deaneries, and then archdeaconries, and then the regions of the diocese, and then the diocese as a whole, along with the other dioceses of the, provinces, the province of Western Australia. A lot of water has since gone under the bridge, but one of the outcomes of the partners in mission consultations was that it was corporately discerned that assistant bishops should become regional bishops, who should not only live, but also work with a degree of autonomy from offices located within each of the regions, so as to be more hands-on and immediately involved in the pastoral care and oversight of the regions. Brian became the Bishop of the Northern Region and was responsible for setting up a regional office that was first located at the Beechborough campus of the John Septimus Rowe Anglican Community School. Later, for strategic reasons, it was moved a little further out to Joondala. An original pragmatic motivation for living and working from offices in regions was to save on Bishop's travel time. But perhaps more importantly, we soon came to see that regionalization clarified our understanding of the church and its mission. In the sense that if the church has a mission, wherever it may be, then that mission will be different from region to region. This was a period of exponential growth in the suburbs of the city of Perth. And the inherited practice of encouraging practices on the, uh, the of encouraging parishes on the fringe of the city to set up a daughter church at its furthermost end, which would eventually become a parish in its own right, and which would then, in turn, set up another daughter church, perhaps in 20 or 30 years' time, would no longer work. For the suburbs were growing so fast that there was an, an immediate need for daughter church after daughter church after daughter church. So a regional plan for church planting was needed. And with the expert assistance of the Department of Parish Development, church sites were acquired for every 10,000 people the population, with 3,000 nominal or potential Anglicans to become a new parish. So Brian spearheaded this strategy in the northern region. David Murray did the same thing in the south, based at Fremantle. 
But the goldfields and country region was a different kettle of fish. There the demographics were in reverse, with depleting populations and often multiple small isolated sub-centres to be serviced. And clearly what was needed was not church planting, but the development of the team training of non-stipendary worker priests and deacons and supportive pastorally oriented ministries of lay people. In the central region, which I cared for myself, the mission of the church was different again. Some inner city parishes like Kensington and Leaderville had plenty of people in the vicinity, but were in need of revitalization, as Angela Webb will testify in the case of Kensington. And others like West Perth, where office blocks of company offices and medical specialists and businesses had by and large replaced the old housing and where there remained only a handful of worshippers, obviously had to be revamped in another way, hence the gathering of the Crosslinks group and the ethnic, ethnically oriented Mandarin speaking community. All this brought to us corporately to the awareness that the church's mission, wherever the church may be, is going to be different from place to place. Brian was the overseer of this work in the northern region and it would not have happened, certainly not the way it did happen, without him. And when he and Doreen moved to Sydney for Brian to become the director of the Australian Board of Missions, he carried this learning experience in his rucksack. The Australian Board of Missions at the time was a remnant survival of the church's missionary outreach of the 19th century, when national churches sent people whom they called missionaries to spread the faith in the colonies of the third world. And so the Australian Board of Missions, which had its origin at the first meeting of Australasian bishops in 1850, looked after missions in places like Papua New Guinea and Borneo, Hong Kong, and the islands of the Pacific, Melanesia and Polynesia. But if the church has a mission, wherever it may be, these places are not our missions, but the mission of the local church, which we are called to support precisely as partners in mission. We may still send some personnel to supply some specific needed expertise, but more importantly, we will send some financial resources to assist the local church in its mission. Brian saw this very clearly, and so set about transforming the work of the Australian Board of Missions and its perception of what it was about, which indeed, at his hands, hands was renamed, no longer the Australian Board of Missions, but the Australian Board of Mission, supporting the mission of the church, wherever the church may be, and whatever it may involve. And surely this is an item of our corporately shared memory of Brian Kime that the Australian church must never forget. Then there is Brian and education. Brian naturally took a keen interest in the church's mission of providing quality education for children. He had inherited Guildford Grammar and Perth College and Hale and St Mary's in the northern region but the needs of the burgeoning suburbs saw the arrival of the first schools of the Anglican Schools Commission, St. Mark's at Hillary's, and especially the John Septimus Row Anglican Community School in Mirabuka, then with its Beechborough campus, within which Brian happily established his regional office. But apart from this, we remember Brian for his commitment to continuing adult education not least his own continuing education. For very notably, through the later years of his life, he added a BA and then an MA to his earlier theological qualifications. And this was achieved while he worked full time with a determination which impressed us all. And indeed, this continuing interest in learning and research also found expression in historical writing. So we remember him as author with publications under his belt 
and collaborator as joint author of local church history. So if tonight, in honouring his memory, we also own the continuing conditioning impact of his memory on us, then Brian is a continuing positive inspiration to us all to work at being mentally alert and not to pass up the opportunities to stretch our minds. There is always something more to learn. So mission and education bulk large in our corporately shared memory of a dear colleague, bishop and pastor, whom we also individually remember more poignantly as husband, father and friend. My often quoted favourite word, favorite words from St John Chrysostom have to do with his 4th century Christian conviction about the communion of saints, which we continue to affirm every time we say the creed. He whom we love and lose is no longer where he was before. He is now wherever we are. We carry Brian prayerfully in our hearts and in our minds, especially as tonight we gather intentionally to cherish the memory of him.
Merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the resurrection and the life of all who believe in him, and who has taught us not to grieve as people without hope for those who sleep in him. Raise us, we pray, from the death of sin to the life of righteousness, that when we depart this life we may rest in him as our hope is our brother Brian does, and that at the resurrection on the last day we may be found acceptable to you and receive the kingdom prepared for all who love and fear you. Grant this merciful Father, through Jesus Christ, our Mediator and Redeemer. Amen. God in his infinite love and mercy bring the whole church living and departed in the Lord Jesus to a joyful resurrection and the fulfillment of his eternal kingdom and the blessing of God Almighty the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always Amen.